In today's video, I'm going to show you 11 pro tips for making your i130 application better if you insist on doing it by yourself. If that sounds good to you, I'll see you after the break. Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Damian DeNoble. I'm an immigration attorney here at Bull City Lawyer in Durham, North Carolina. And on this channel, we try to give immigrants reliable information so that they can make better decisions and avoid costly mistakes. So if that sounds good to you, please comment and subscribe. That helps our videos reach more people and ultimately leads to a more successful channel. And with that out of the way, let's get into our 11 pro tips for the I-130 petition for a spouse and or a close relative. My number one tip before we even get into some of the practical advice on what to do when you actually have the application in front of you is don't do this by yourself have it reviewed. Maybe you don't wanna have it reviewed by a lawyer, that's fine if that's what you choose not to do, but have somebody review it. If your English is not as good as you think it could be, if you don't understand anything on the form, if you are unsure about really just about anything, give it to somebody to look over, give it to somebody you trust. There are lots of nonprofits you can find them locally online, just Google it. You can also find a link online where I'm happy to review applications through avo.com. The number two tip, again, before we get into anything, is do not file your application first and ask questions later. What do I mean by that? Let's say you are a petitioner for somebody else. So you are an American citizen or a US permanent resident and you are petitioning for a family member. Do not just assume that everything in your family member's background is friendly to the petition. For example, lots of family members that you may have may have crossed into the United States without inspection. If you turn in the application and that comes up after the government does a background check, you could accidentally, because you didn't ask questions before filing the application, get that family member deported. Finally, tip number three, before we get into all the practical tips about the application is never put down false information. Some people are under the false impression that you can uh, omit very important details like your immigration history, like your prior spousal history, the amount of money you make, that will get you into a lot of trouble sooner rather than later. Especially now in the age of digital files, everything you sent to the government gets stored in the same place. And when I file Freedom of Information Acts for clients, for example, sometimes I'll get hundreds, sometimes even thousands of pages of that client's immigration history, which consists of all the forms they've ever turned in. All right, now we're going to get into the actual meat of the I-130. First thing we have to do is set up an environment for you to successfully fill out this application. I've seen tutorials where people are filling out the application by hand, and while that is fine, I would suggest to you that unless you have amazing handwriting, you should probably use software that can fill out the PDFs that you can download online at the USCIS website. There's two kinds of software. I'm where the people are on budgets. I know that immigration is expensive generally and that it's important to save money during the process. PDF Escape is a free software that you can go download right now and use on your computer. If you'd like a software that is cost a little more money, I always use my law office, Adobe DC, and there's a link for that uh, in the bottom as well. Tip number five, and this goes back to setting up your environment. So you have your PDF software, you have your really nice pen if you are going to handwrite it. Now you need to set up a filing system for yourself. You're not just going to complete the I-130 in one night. You're not going to complete it likely in one week. It's going to take several weeks or several months, especially if you're doing things like spousal petitions or working with family members who are in different areas of the country, okay? So here's one thing that you should get. You should get a filing box, okay? And that filing box can be very simple. It can be some sort of crate box that you have lying around in the kitchen. It doesn't really matter. I use this, this is, you can find these for a couple of dollars in Office Depot or online, okay? And then what I want you to do, because I want you to take this seriously, I want you to label that box. You can do it yourself or you can use a labeler. And here's kind of like my bonus tip for this. You should buy a labeler. Um, as an immigrant, 
dealing with paperwork is going to be a part of your life for a long time. There's the I-130, after that you might do the 485, you might do a consular adjustment, you'll have naturalization coming up if you do everything well, you'll have lots of paperwork to file if you need to renew your green cards, so get social security cards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you really need to come, kind of become a paperwork master. So this presents a great opportunity for you to get a labeler. It's like magic, they keep you organized and they put everything where it needs to be because you can create new spaces for things to be in. If you're interested in what kind of labeler we use, we have provided that in the links. We've also provided some uh, cheaper label uh, options that you can explore and just get straight on Amazon for relatively very little money. What else might you need in your dedicated filing home office area to get ready to file your immigration forms? First thing you might need is a two-hole punch. This is a sort of artifact of American bureaucracy, but everything you do with the USCIS, Department of State, they really prefer, or hey, Lord forbid, if you have to go to immigration court for some reason, everything has to be two hole punched at the top. And they use these things which are called fasteners, which are usually sold in boxes. Some of them come with little uh, you know, fastener lids. You want some tabs, as we'll get to this in a minute, but tabs are gonna help you mark places where you need to do some more work so you don't have to remember it all. You might want to use these clips. These are often an alternative to fasteners. And of course, your workhorse here is going to be the paper clip, which will be used for a number of things, including attaching your check to the final form. Um, I have kind of included this in the description as well so that you can remember it. My six power tip and this is something you should get anyway, is to get a scanner. Working with USCIS, working on any immigration forms is document heavy, and you also want to be using copies of any original documents that you have. A lot of people think they can just take a photo with their phone, and there are some good scanner apps, which I'll also link to in the bottom, but really nothing still beats a scanner. And the great news is there are some really cheap models you can get online, sort of like wand scanners, right, or mobile scanners that you can carry with you, and then just sort of like Wi-Fi things or USB things into whatever device you plan on printing off from. And so I've included that here as well in the links. All right, tip number seven. We are actually gonna be looking at the form for this one. Uh, there are lots of spaces on any I-130 form. And I know you've heard that if there is a blank space, you should either put none or not applicable or N slash A in that space to indicate that you have nothing to say or that this question doesn't apply to you. May I suggest that that's not entirely necessary. There are a lot of acolytes for the not applicable approach where you write NA or not applicable or none in every single black blank space. But actually the forms have gotten a lot of revisions, especially in recent years. What the I-130 does in particular is that it gives you little prompts that say, if you answer yes on section X, then do not answer section Y. On the PDF version, it will actually make it impossible for you to fill out uh, certain fields if you put a no or a yes, okay? So what that tells me and what I do with my clients' applications is I just leave them blank. I don't put an A, I don't put not applicable, I don't put none because it makes the form look sloppy in my opinion. Now, this is much easier to do if you're filling it out on a PDF piece of software than it is if you're filling it out by hand, which is just another good reason to download PDF Escape or get Adobe DC, as I mentioned earlier in the video. One more tiny power tip that relates to this NA not applicable. For the A number, for those of you who are filling out A numbers, if you don't have an A number or somebody you're petitioning for doesn't have an A number, instead of putting none, just fill all of the spaces up with zeros. I think it makes it look more professional. It's what's kind of technically uh, asked of us to do. So just another power tip. Power tip number nine is using the actual spaces on the form to add extra notes. So form on the last page, it says, if you have additional notes to some of the questions, add them here. My power tip is don't use these. What you should do instead is write C addendum and actually attach a separate piece of paper formatted with 
your name, the form number, the A number of the beneficiary. There's directions in the description. This just makes it seem more professional and it prevents you from having to use this sort of clunky space to write in. I find that it's often not enough space. The kind of very thin columns make it hard to write anything in. And even if you're using a PDF software, there's some formatting restrictions that make it hard to use. So just upload your favorite word processor, Word, Google Docs, whatever, write the addendum on there, and then add it on. Tip number 10, translations, translations, translations. If you're using any sort of document, if you're attaching anything to your form, a birth certificate, a marriage certificate, proof of residency of some sort, some sort of proof of income, if it's in an language other than English, you have to attach a translation. It should be a certified translation. There are services that can do this for you. Friends can do this for you as long as they add some sort of statements certifying that the translation's accurate. I've added a link to a professional service that you can use. They're called the Spanish Group. Our firm uses them. Uh, if you check out their prices, I think it's about $30 per certified page. Uh, that's in the links as well. Bonus tip. Always count translations as part of your budget for the I-130. Uh, you can get away with just paying the government fees sometimes, but if you want to do it right, avoid a lot of RFEs, avoid you know a post-filing expensive trip to a lawyer that specializes in dealing with whatever problem you've encountered, do it right the first time, spend a little money up front. Translations is probably the most important place to do that because a bad translation is worse than no translation at all sometimes. Final tip, tip 11, learn all the answers that you've put into the form by heart. Because if you ever have to do an interview uh, where somebody's checking for consistency, whether you're doing a spousal petition or other kind of petition, and now since President Trump has announced that all of these forms basically are gonna be having interviews. This is doubly important. Practice, 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 knowing exactly what you put down on the form. You should try to memorize it by heart. If you're older or you have trouble remembering things, then at least try to be familiar with all the information and have somebody practice with you, asking you questions in a back and forth. I hope that was helpful. My parting word is don't take this form lightly. Don't take anything in immigration lightly. Prepare, prepare, prepare. Getting the right materials, filling out the form in a neat, organized way, and then just figuring out how to be neat and organized about keeping your documents as an immigrant are super important skills you should be developing every day. I hope you like this video. If you'd like to see more tutorials, if you'd like to receive more tips, if you'd like to receive more reliable information for your immigration experience so you can avoid costly mistakes and make better choices, please subscribe and let us know what you'd like to see in the comments. Until next time, we'll see you later.